Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In the middle portion of Prudentius's poem, Psychomachia, the battle for or within the soul, there's two particular battles that are very tough, at least at first, for the virtues. And it looks like the battle might actually go against them and the vices might win. And there's two vices that are really at the center of this. The first is indulgence or luxury, luxuria. And the second is greed, avaritia. And both of these wage war in a different way than the earlier ones did, like lust or even pride. These are a bit more subtle challenges, and they throw the virtues into confusion, disarray. Uh, luxury even robs them, as we're going to find out, of their courage. But it turns out that there is a virtue or set of virtues that are particularly important for combating these more difficult, more demanding opponents. So we, we get indulgence first. From the far edges of the world where the sun sets comes their enemy indulgence. And we have this really interesting depiction. Reputation means nothing to her. She doesn't care about that. She's already lost that. Her curls are perfumed. Her restless eyes are not still. Her voice is languid and bored. So what we have here is a vice personified, the indulgence or luxury, the delighting in pleasures, the directing oneself that way is in fact that kind of being. And what we find out is that she lives for pleasure and she's not that interested in fighting. As a matter of fact, she'll win her victory over the virtues, taking over the soul in a much different way. As she arrives on the scene, she is lazily belching because of a long feast she's just left. She, she's self-indulgent. She comes at the dawn because she heard the trumpets calling her to fight. Now, how is she going to fight? So her bare feet crush flowers on the pavement. She walks through puddles of wine and perfume. Drunkenly, she goes off to war in her chariot. Her beauty inspires the army of her compatriots, the other vices. They're like, wow, this is, this is going to go good for us. And Prudentius goes on to say, it's a strange battle. She doesn't shoot arrows from her bow. No lances are hurled at the enemy's line. She holds no sword. So what are her weapons? Well, flowers, flowers as items of beauty, of indulgence, uh, baskets of violets and roses, two, two flowers that were particularly important at that time. Blossoms she scatters. The virtues are won over by her charms. Her sweetened breath, her strong odors, right? Uh, these things that, that feel nice, right? Um, that and her beauty make the virtues lose their courage, their capacity to resist. And their strength is, is uh, like she says, crushed. Their courage fails. Surely they've been defeated. They put down their weapons and they gaze at the chariot. They gaze at the uh, tinkling harness, the costly spokes. As this happened, the entire army finds itself pervaded with an intense desire to surrender. 
So this is a big catastrophe, right? The first four of the combats have been won, and now the virtues are losing out to a single big vice. But there is a virtue that, or one of the virtues can rally the other ones, sobriety, uh, sobrietas, uh, the opponent of self-indulgence, luxurious indulgence, a virtue with a strong will, she weeps and then she plants her flags and restores their courage, the virtue's courage, with a speech. She says, what blind madness troubles your confused minds? To whom have you pledged allegiance? You are fighters of iron. How can flowers restrain you? And so she's reminding them of what they can do. And she, she says to them, where is the tunic woven by faith? One of the very first of the virtues and given as a protection to the young heart she'd already renewed. Then she tells them what'll happen if they give in. You will be busy. You'll attend great banquets that last through the night. You'll spill wine and costly dishes. Your couches will be soaked with drink and the silk emblems will still be wet with yesterday's do. And then she reminds them of biblical stories. Remember the thirst in the desert when the Hebrews or Israelites are wandering with Moses. Uh, remember the water that gushed from the side of the rock when the prophet's staff struck the stone and made a spring where there was none. Were your father's tents not filled with heavenly food? Was this food not like that which Christ give us? After eating that, well, after such a feast, how can you let drunkenness and wantonness take you to the den of indulgence. You're an army that survived every threat. Neither the fury of wrath nor idolatry could halt you, but a drunken dancer is doing so. And so she's rallying them and telling them, come do battle under the flag. And all the virtues will join me in forcing that vice indulgence to pay the great penalty. She raises the cross of Christ high. She pushes the holy wood against the uh, horses of the chariot. The beasts are frightened. And then sobriety, uh, after the, the chariot is, is uh, overturned, strikes the death blow by hurling a great stone that she finds nearby. It's interesting because here we also have the intervention of something that doesn't seem to be either a vice or a virtue, chance right? Chance found the stone. Chance directs its short flight so that the nose and teeth of luxury are smashed. Her red lips are driven into the arch of her ruined mouth. Uh, Sobriety then speaks up, drink up. You've drained many cups before. Surely you can stomach your own body. You've reveled in the excesses of sweetness. You should enjoy morsels like these. The taste of death must be bitter in your mouth. And then Luxury dies. Then all of those who were enjoying her company scatter. The vices now flee and they leave behind them all sorts of spoils. This is something that happened in ancient battles, right? Vanity is stripped naked. Her long flowing robes are dragged away. The garlands that adorn allurement are shredded. The gold ornaments are broken and the confusion of strife shatters her jewels. Pleasure is more happy to flee through the throne, the thorns with injured feet. And it goes on and on. Now, This looks like a great win for the virtues, and it is. Now, notice what they they don't do, uh, what they could have done, and what they don't do instead. They don't take any of this stuff. They don't take trophies. They don't strip the battlefield. Who does? Well, here's where the biggest challenge so far shows up. Greed, avaritia, comes on the scene. And greed, we should point out, is one of the main vices throughout uh, Christian theology from the early period all the way into later times. So greed folds up her robes and gathers up everything left behind. Uh, When her pockets are filled, she stuffs money bags and purses with her treasure. Um, And then she's followed by, as, as the poem says, a number of other vices, care, hunger, fear, anxiety, perjury, dread, fraud, fabrication, sleeplessness, sordidness, and we're going to find a whole bunch of others, pride of possession, you know. Uh, These are all nurtured by greed. These are the children of greed. And what happens? Well, the human race, gripped by greed and these other vices, 
is involved in a great slaughter. Uh, droves of living things are destroyed. And we, ha- we're, we read, for example, many men like pigs are driven to furnaces where gold is being burnt out of its rock. Each man, though it dooms him to death by fire, stretches his hand into the glowing chamber hoping to find gold. Of all the vices, Prudentius tells us, there is none more frightening than greed. Greed wraps the lives of human beings in calamities. They only escape when they're thrown to hell's fire, something even worse. And so fortunately, reason, ratio, is there to protect, as uh, Prudentius will tell us, the priests, uh, the tribe of Levi, she, her foster son. She covers them with her great shield and saves them from the deadly rush of greed with reason's assistance the priests are saved and remain strong and uninjured in the battle only a few of them feel the lance of greed and are only scratched now greed realizes that the battle is going against them and she gives a scream of rage and begins to speak she says we are losing We lack stamina. We can't maintain our attack. Our power to hurt is feeble, though before none could resist us. Reason is what is standing in the way. She says, I and I alone, avaricious greed, have brought to the sticks all who have ever crossed that current. Hell was enriched by us, and it is in our debt. How can it be that now our strength is turned aside while fortune turns her twisted smile on our Weapons. Christians have no concern for faces stamped on coins. Money, right? They have no concern for hammered silver. No treasure has value for they think its glory is tarnished. What does this newly found fastidious pose mean? We won the Iscariot, Judas, who betrayed Christ, um, with the most compelling reasons for loyalty. Avarice destroyed him with only a few coins. Why can't we do something now? And then she does some trickery. She changes her bearing. She changes her appearance. She lays her weapons aside and changes what she looks like. In the form of and dress of simple austerity, she becomes the virtue human beings have known as thrift, frugi, frugality, right? And so now she is uh, hiding within the virtues themselves. Bellona, the goddess of war, also takes on the appearance of thrift as well. The battle line begins to falter. The virtues waver because their priestly leaders are confined while the rank and file is confounded. The monster's appearance easily misleads them. They cannot distinguish friend from foe. Greed's appearance is a fluid and changing thing. So now, once again, greed seems to be winning. A vice seems to be taking out all the other virtues. Now we have uh, another virtue that comes on the scene to help us out. Operatio, which we can translate as good works. Good works is, in a certain respect, the opposite of greed, at least in its actions, right? It's not the opposite in disposition, perhaps. She enters the fight last, putting her hand in the battle. She can guarantee their success. Every impediment thrown aside, she moves through the ranks without armor or even a shield. Once she had been heavy with riches and money, she's now able to be freed by helping the poor. She scatters her inheritance. Rich with faith, she examines her empty purse and estimates the value of her estate in heaven with the interest that accrues to it. Greed sees good works and sees the writing on the wall, is dismayed, tries to uh, get away. But what happens? Uh, The virtue leaps on her before the vice can escape. Her neck is seized by hands as strong as iron. Greed is being strangled by good works, squeezing blood from her throat until it is dry. And then she she tells uh, everybody, take off your armor, honest men, drop your weapons. The cause of our troubles is dead. The pure can rest now that the desire for gain is gone. It is good to wish for nothing that is not needed. Simple food, one coat are enough to refresh and case our weak bodies. With nature satisfied, you need, uh, there is no need for anything more. 
we're supposed to have faith that we're going to be protected and taken care of. And now the rest of the vices take off. Suffering, fear, violence, crime, and fraud are dispelled. And the kind lady peace comes onto the scene. Yet another of the important virtues. She expels the storms of war. Everybody is taking off their armor and their weapons. And it looks like the battle has finally been won within the soul. Greed, indulgence have been fought against. The appropriate virtues have come forward. And all the other vices have left in fear and dismay. 